So yesterday's class on Dina, on Dina. A couple of uh, a couple of additional points. One. What are the key lessons that we can get out of so terrible a passage of scripture? Now, I know some of you had some discussion about that, and I heard some wonderful interpretations, really wonderful interpretations. Um, one one point that was made is it is absolutely essential to take care of our young people and sh to ensure that we invest the appropriate time and effort required to attract them and retain them in the truth. So that's it. That's, that's one wonderful thing. There were other lessons too having to do with ecclesial life, having to do with relationships. It is a great thing when a piece of scripture is studied by any of us because the ability to interpret and apply its principles to our individual lives can sometimes be as diverse as our individual unique lives can be. And that is a good thing. Scripture is not just about one single lesson every time. There are diverse lessons and principles that come out and that enrich our lives as we reflect on them. Now, another question was asked, and it's a perfectly valid comment, and, and I'd say it's, a, it's an important thing to, to just keep track of so that we maintain our focus on the theme for the Bible school and for this series in particular. How is the God of the fallen at work in the chapter involving Dinah and the family. Well, God was obviously working behind the scenes. God was working with the family, maturing the men and women in it. Each of them, through the experience of tragedy, through the experience of bad decisions, will have added to the experience that would ultimately, together, in the cumulative effect and impact of it all, have changed them to become the people they needed to, to become. When Judah looked back in his life, when the brethren looked back in their lives, when they listened to their old father talking to them, saying his last words, giving them his predictions about what their future would be, they wouldn't just think about the evil they had done to Joseph. They would think about the evil they had done in that town that they had massacred everybody in. They would reflect on all of the bad things they had done, all the, the mistakes they had made. Judah would have Tamar in mind, and all of these things that had happened in the life he adopted as he went out and became virtually a Gentile in the things that he did. And so the cumulative effect of the experiences of life with God working in the maturing of a human mind has in the end the impact of changing that human being. So God is at work even in that process of aging and reflection and thinking and regrets. But there's another way in which the God of the fallen is at work in this story involving Dinah. If the Jacobites, the Jacobites, the family of Jacob, had united themselves with the Shechemites, they would have lost the truth completely. Absolutely, it would have been gone. And so, as a consequence, the separation of the two peoples, though it happened in the most brutal and awful of circumstances, was something that had to happen. So God, using this bad situation, created, in spite of all the evil of the circumstance, a necessary separation. Because that casts our minds back to, to, to the work of Samson, for instance, where it says in the Samson narrative that he sought an occasion against the Philistines. And who is that? It's God. God sought an occasion against the Philistines because of the fact that for the first time in the period of the judges, or at least in this section of the period of the judges, the Israelites are at peace and they have accepted and acquiesced in the situation with the Philistines. They're not crying out for a deliverer. They're at peace with them. And God says, I'm not having any of this. We're going to have to stir up conflict. So God seeks to stir up a fight, to pick a fight with the Philistines and works with all of Samson's wrong-headedness, strong will, compulsive behavior, 
in order to secure his people and their separation from those who would have overwhelmed them spiritually and completely diluted their faith. And so, in the matter of the Shechemites, in the days of Dinah, God's hand was at work so that a separation might occur. And there might be the securing of his truth amongst these people. There's a couple of other interesting points. And I should point out that Brother Jim has done some significant work on Dinah and the possible connection to a group of people called the Dinites that show up in the book of Ezra and some wonderful spiritual principles at work in the Samaritans that almost create a beautiful symmetry of the story, the other side of the story, and a very wonderful spiritual series of lessons. And he, he shared that information with me, and I know he'd be happy to share that deck or that information with any of you that would like to, to hear. And his sister came up to me and showed me a section out of a commentary uh, on Joshua, the Expositor series. And here's, I'm going to read a little bit of it to you, and you'll find this interesting. The hand of the God of the fall at work. And this is looking at Joshua 9, verse 18. And here's what the commentator says, I believe from Mansfield, or HP. The trickery by which the Hivites of Gibeon, remember Hamor the Hivite, beguiled Joshua in measure repaid the treachery of Jacob's sons against the Hivites of Shechem. For Hamor who defied Tyler was a Hivite, according to Genesis 34, verse 2. And by subterfuge, Simeon and Levi induced the men of Shechem to enter into a covenant and submit to the right of circumcision. Then, with base treachery, they put them to the sword. Now, in the days of Joshua, the tables were turned. Joshua was compelled to fulfill the terms of the covenant made with these Hivites who had deluded him. The name of the God they worshipped was Baal Berith, the Lord of the Covenant or League, which confirms the impression of their unwarlike character. They were used to gaining by diplomacy, what they could not obtain by war. So, so that's an interesting additional point. So the Hivites, the Hivites are destroyed in this town by Simeon, Le Levi, and their brethren through this fake situation, this, this, this camouflage intent, this hidden truth in a crony covenant. <laughs> the Hivites come back and do the same thing generations later in Joshua. And that's a, a, another wonderful, symmetrical kind of, 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 of circumstance uh, that balances out the picture of Dinah a little bit also. So, so, so I, hope, I hope that, that helps a little bit. And these ideas came from you, not from me. We shift hundreds of years from the days of Dinah many, many, many years into the days of King David in 2 Samuel chapter 11. And when we get to this section, it's a time of warfare. The consolidation of the rule of David. David dealing with his enemies, with the Ammonites, the war has been going well, but they have withdrawn into the stronghold, the citadel of Rabbah. The battle is hot, and it's very difficult. David, it said, had sent all of his men and Joab because of the fact that the Ammonites had sought and received assistance from the Syrians in this battle, this war that was underway. And when we find him in chapter 11, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel. Now, there's a kind of, there's a kind of value judgment 
being made right off the bat in the beginning of this chapter. I want to infer that the writer seems to be applying this is not where David should have been at a time of battle. It was a time of year where the kings of the region went forth to battle. But David stays David stays at home. Now I know they told him we will not let you go into the heat of the battle lest we lose you. But David wasn't even anywhere near the battle. He was at home. Now why would David be at home? We get tired, brethren. After years of wars and fighting and strife, all the destructive activity that we can be engaged in, we get tired. So David might have been tired of fighting when he decided that he would stay home and send everybody else out to war. But it wasn't good for David to yield to his battle weariness. After all, David was called to continue to fight. He was called to do the kind of thing that he ought to have been doing instead of what he was doing at this particular point in time. Think of who David was now. He wasn't the young lad shouting at the ugly Philistine giant on the field. He wasn't the young man who won the hearts of the people of the nation. He wasn't the, the man still young, fleeing around the mountain just on the other side of where Saul and his ministers were. He was a man who now had a reputation to protect. He was the hero of Israel. He had ascended a kind of pedestal upon which the nation had put him. He'd done his bit. He fought the wars that he had fought. And there he is, the hero of Israel, in a place he ought not to be. And he doesn't know what to do with himself. And we know he doesn't know what to do with himself because he's tossing and turning at night. And it says, verse 2, it came to pass in an even, evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. So he can't sleep, doesn't know what to do with himself, his counselors, everybody, they're all out to war. All that's left in the home is, well, servants and the, the women of the, of the household, children, and David. David, who had he been out on the battlefield, though not in the heat of battle itself, would inspire the soldiers just by his very presence, would be able to guide, to direct, to see it tactically, strategically, lend his voice to the plans and the execution of the plans on the battlefield. And so David is unable to know what to do with himself. And there he is, tarrying in Jerusalem, and on the rooftop. And it says, he saw washing herself from the roof, he saw a woman washing herself. The woman was very beautiful to look upon. Now, opinion in our community is divided on the responsibility, and the attitude, and the character of Bathsheba. One side of the community feels she was a sharp witted, cunning, manipulative woman who knew exactly what she was doing. And she went up there to be seen of David so that she might execute a plan that would lead to her getting into his good graces and becoming what she became at his side. That's one. 
interpretation. Interpretation. Well, the other interpretation is that she bore no responsibility whatsoever, and all of what happens is on David's shoulders alone. And that David, a man of power, a man of might, a man of authority, so manipulated the circumstance she had no choice, she had no voice, she only had to comply. So those are, those, those are two views on opposite ends of the, the spectrum of interpretation of the story. And I, I want to please underscore, what we're doing in this series is all about imagination. It's, 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 it's imagining our way in between the lines and the words to the people situations that are going on. You might imagine it differently. It might irritate you. It might chafe under your skin to be able to, to, to listen to these things and that's not right. That can't be right. That's ridiculous. Good. If it irritates you and goes you into thinking it through for yourself, I love it. And I'm looking to give you answers because I haven't got any. There's no, nothing authoritative about this. It's imagination. If you look at the text and you're more attentive to it, then that's a wonderful thing. So you might see it differently. And that's okay. And so in the situation, there she is on the roof. Now, what happened in these days was that people would go up and have a bath on the roof. Now, the way we imagine it is some kind of a bathtub looking thing now there she is, stark naked for anybody to see. But that's not the way it might have been. Oftentimes on these, on these rooms, what would happen is you would have a little building, just a little, a little makeshift kind of room that would have the tub in it, whatever the, the wooden tub or the metal tub was. And a servant would be there helping the woman because that's the way it was. That there'd be towel, and there'd be the ointments, and so on and so forth that, that she would use. Yes, it's nighttime, so there might be a lamp in the room. So David, looking down, wouldn't necessarily see a woman brazenly in the open displaying herself. He might see through an opening and through a window into that room, and behold, that she was very beautiful. But this might not have been a woman displaying herself so that she might be seen. And remember, she's a Jewish woman from a good home. There was a kind of decorum with which she would have conducted herself socially and culturally. And so it says, he saw a woman washing herself and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. Let's just think about that. There's David, this man with all his passionate nature, all the fire, all the love, all the fury inside of himself. And he sees this beautiful woman, and his curiosity and his passions are engaged. And when those passions were used to protect all of the rejects of Israeli society that kept company with him, then it was a good thing. When the passion was one of devotion and loyalty and it prevented him from killing the man that was trying to kill him, it was a good thing. But in this circumstance, his strength was a great weakness. And God tests us in our strengths. He tests us in our strengths. Moses, the meekest of all men, is tested in his meekness and loses his temper at the rock. He tests us in our strengths. And so here's David being sorely tried, sorely tested. And he says that it quiet. Now, you are part of the palace staff. Your king goes up onto the roof, 
comes down, not fully himself, a little bit stressed, his pupils are dilated, and he says to you, I want you to go and find out who that woman is. Who is she? Who is she? And what do you say in a palace with a powerful king? Well, you wouldn't say what the person says. This is a very brave person talking to the king. Now, 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 now let's see what, what the person says. And one said, <laughs> one said, <laughs> you know, one said, it's almost as if the person's name is Clovis. The person's a bit anonymous, but somebody with absolute courage says, isn't this Bathsheba? Now the person's going to stop that. It's Bathsheba. That's not what the person says. This one says, isn't that Bathsheba? The daughter of Eliam? The wife of Uriah? The Hittite? Now, talk about the activity of the God of the fallen. This is what has just been said to him. That is the wife of a man who adores you. He came in from the outside into the truth because of the kind of man he believed you to be. That's his wife. This Gentile who joined us because of you. That's the daughter of one of the heroes of Israel. One of your mighty men. That's the granddaughter of your close friend. And I don't even need to say it. Because by not saying it, I've said it. It's Ahithophel's granddaughter, David. That's who that is. In that one little sentence, David received a rebuke, a caution, a warning, and a reminder. He had everything he needed to do the right thing. Given to him by the God of the fallen through his courageous servant on staff. Now tell me something. David was a man sharp, sharp as a razor blade. He could perceive subtle shifts in people's emotions, their thoughts. He was a man of high emotional intelligence. And he could understand what was being said underneath what was being said. Ah, uh, uh, excuse me, did you just tell me something? But does Joab have anything to do with what you just said to me? <laughs> I thought so. And so when this person says, when he or she says to him, do you not think he knew exactly what they were saying? David, don't go any further. This will only be trouble for you. And he still did it. And it says, David sent messengers. Now, tell me something. There's, you know, telecommunications, teleconference, telechristadelphia. <laughs> if you want to know almost instantaneously, within two seconds, who your daughter is sitting next to at a Bible school in Adelaide, Australia, and you are in Victoria, one tweet or text will tell you. Immediately. Such is the sophistication of the Christadelphian grapevine. Right? Right. What do you think a palace is like? Just, just consider it. If you've ever seen the television series, I know good Christophians don't watch TV, but some of you might have read about an episode in a book. <laughs> and you might have seen a series or heard your relatives in the world, those Gentiles out there, talking about a series called Upstairs, Downstairs. And you will recall that the servants down below knew everything and more about what was going on upstairs, but the people upstairs had no clue that they knew everything. They were too busy being aristocratic and immoral. Remember that? Right. The palace staff knew everything. 
And so when he asks this question, what do you think Mr. Man or Miss Lady did directly after? He's asking me about this woman? Bathsheba! What is he asking me that for? Oh, this, ah, this is trouble. Because I know what's going to happen next. You watch, you watch, you watch what's going to happen. He should be outside. He should be out there with Joab and everybody. Keeping an eye on Joab. That man's rotten. <laughs> And you can imagine, when he sent messengers to get Bathsheba, this is a colossal lapse in judgment. Driven by passion. Driven by a focus that does not accommodate the bigger picture of consequences and realities. Just like all of our acts of passion our passionate reactions to each other, the passions that sometimes consume us, and in this day and age, with the internet and all its evil, I and you as men are affected by these passions deeply, all of us. And so he doesn't even pay attention to the fact that the messengers themselves are going to this woman's house to bring this beautiful woman over to the palace. And then he asks him, what does he want to see good for? Oh, did you hear? He was up on the roof last night. And this is what he saw. So now he wants to talk to her. Oh my goodness. What is he doing? Right? Yeah, you try to stop him. Nobody can stop him when he gets going. That's it. And so the messengers go and the king wants to see you. And they bring Bathsheba, the daughter. Eliab, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And it says, They took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her. And he lay with her. So in a way, you could say the classic situation has just occurred. David saw this woman, and David took what he wanted. Now, you might ask yourself, how would a man with women like Abigail amongst his wives still feel this compulsion? And all we can say in connection with that is David is a man and a human being with frailty and all the inconsistencies that any of us might struggle with as a man or a woman in God's truth. And when he saw, when he saw this woman, the, the, the opening gulf, the emptiness inside, looked like it could be filled with passion. It was a time with her. And then he, he, he does, he does what he does. So what about Bathsheba then? What about Bathsheba? You are the daughter of a hero of Israel, the granddaughter of the most brilliant man in the kingdom, and the wife of a workaholic who has come into the truth because he loves David and the God of Israel, under whose wings he has come to shelter as a Gentile. When you grow up in a household that is a military household, there isn't a lot of time for softness, for tender times together. Just when you're having the time that you need to have with your husband, he's off, off with the army to another battle. You would have seen a mother who would have been quite neglected, though she might have been loved, by a father that was up and down, up and down. He didn't become a hero of Israel by doing it part time, once in a while, sporadically. That's not how he became a hero in Israel. And so, her mom might have been somewhat neglected. And here, here she is, a beautiful woman, wishing she could have more time with the man she loves. And when he's home, He's not really home. 
just like your husband sometimes. When he's home, he has his iPhone, his Blackberry, his 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 Android device, all of which will sound ridiculous in ten years if anybody listens to this. <laughs> Because then they'll just have holographic chips that they touch in their hand. Bing, boom, hello, you should get into work now or I will kill you. <laughs> right? And, and so, just as your man is distracted by all the trouble and the bother and the challenges and the strategic plans and the operational or the operating plans that are not going according to plan, and all the teams that he's working with or managing, the division, the department, whatever the case may be. And you know there's always half of his mind somewhere else when you're talking to him. Bathsheba might have had the same thing. Now, Uriah came in from the outside. And when you come in from the outside, you feel like you have so much catching up to do. You weren't raised with Sunday school or Christadelphian Sunday school. You didn't have Christadelphian parents. You didn't have family and, 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 and loved ones and friends and the truth. He never went to conferences as a child. He didn't go to a youth camp. He never went to any study days. He didn't go to Bible school. And all of a sudden, you come in from the outside and you have to work twice and three times as hard just to catch up. I remember Rose and I. <laughs> Rose and I, I had been raised in a, in a Hindu uh, uh, household. My, my father was a Brahmin, though my mother was a Presbyterian, right? Yeah. I, I, I want to laugh thinking about it too myself. Yeah. I don't know, I was a, what would that make me? A Presbyterian or a Hindu I don't know. So, so, Rose was raised in a Jewish home. She, she'd been adopted into a Jewish home. And, um, and she, she and I, you know, came to the first Christadelphian Sunday school as visitors uh, that we'd ever been to. And there was a Sunday school superintendent, and the superintendent was asking the little children, they must have been five, maybe six, maybe seven, at Scarlet Road in Toronto, um, well, what did the serpent do? And one little girl jumped up and said, the serpent bited her! <laughs> well, of course, the serpent didn't bite her. That was just her interpretation of the situation. <laughs> but the right answers came around with these little kids. And Rose and I felt like we were going to cry because we didn't even know that. <laughs> we didn't even, and we thought, these children are like six years old. How will we ever become Christadelphians? So, my ridiculous story aside, this man would have been twice as dedicated as your average Israeli soldier. He would have been twice as dedicated as someone raised in the truth. He would have been twice as intensely engaged in working out and trying to understand spiritual principles, the law of Moses. What God meant, what do these promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob mean? How were the Gentiles worked into these promises? When is this great Redeemer coming? Is it David? Is it David? But it can't be David. Because he was told it's not him, it's someone else. Someone else that will build the house of Yahweh one day. And so this man from the outside is the husband of this woman. And it says, she was purified from her uncleanness, she returned unto her house. And so this incredibly attractive man who is at the pinnacle of the nation, who is so gracious and subtle in his speech, who can catch every shift of emotion, who can pour out so much love and attention when he's speaking with people that he's speaking with, calls you into him. And you are from the same territory as him. You come from the same tribe as he does. And he looks at you and he sees the kind of girl he grew up with. And he is a mature man, approaching 50, looks at young, beautiful you, and he looks at you with the eyes you wish your husband would look at you with. And you haven't seen for years. And when he embraces you, 
everything goes too far for both of you too quickly. Without thought, without heed to the outcomes and the consequences, in a moment of passionate engagement, a moment stolen for both of you, a moment that would lead then to her having to go home with deep concerns. Now, she didn't go home alone. The messengers must have taken her back home. Can you imagine the silence? Can you imagine her in the silence of her home? Thinking about what has just happened and then counting the days and realizing she's pregnant. Can you imagine the fear, the shame, the terror, the horror, the regrets in her heart? And then she sends that faithful message. The woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I'm with child. Now you just picture the way a palace works. You don't just show up at Buckingham Palace, knock on the door and say, I'd like to talk to the Queen. That's not going to happen. And so, someone from the household of the arrival Hittite comes to the door and says, I have got to speak to the King immediately. The staff of the palace say, why? What? I can't talk to you about that. I have a message from Bathsheba. It is extremely urgent. I've got to talk to the king. Now, don't you think, just like Christadelphians do, they would put two and two together and begin to think, there's something bad coming down the pipe. David clears out the room so that he can get this message. The person gives the message, leaves the building immediately. Doesn't look at anybody, doesn't talk to him, straight out the door. Servants that come in, you know the way servants will work. They're looking at David with gimlet eye for anything they can discern about what that conversation might have been like. What room is he in? What is he asking him to do? Are his hands shaking? Are he distracted? Is he distracted? Does he look sweaty? Is he irritable? Is he yelling? What's going on? Something's wrong. So in the palace, these people were working out what was going on. Now imagination is what's at work in my head right now. But just imagine yourself into your ecclesia, your family, and the palace. So what happens next is, David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. Now, I worked for a man like Joab once. I'm going to describe him to you. Not one ounce of mercy in him. Not an ounce. He was all about business. His business. Consolidating his power, beating down and obliterating his enemies, strengthening his control over the owner of the company, ensuring that he knew things no one else knew that would ensure his position for life. And all he had to do was make a particular face at the owner of the company and that would settle him down instantaneously. Because the face meant, you know what I know. Do you want all these other people to know? And the owner would then defer to him and say, whatever, I agree with him. And so Joab, who is also an extremely perceptive man, a mind, like a Henkel's knife 
has this poor little messenger come to him. And nobody just went up, <laughs> Jonah, how's it going, mate? <laughs> None of that. People went in, okay, what am I going to say? I've got to make, this is my message. I've got to, okay, and these, and these are the points I'm going to make. I'm going to say this and say that, da, 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 da. Because that's how we used to have to think before we went into this man I worked for. And you would always find the chink. What about this? And you'd think, oh, you feel your stomach drop. There was one man before he met with him. He, he was, um, he, he, he would look absolutely sheet white. And he'd have sweat rolling down the sides of his face before he saw him. And he would invariably come back from his office. And he was a director, crying, after dealing with that boss. So this messenger comes to Joab. Joab says, come here and sit. Sit. How are things going in the palace? But well, I, uh, as far as I know, things are going pretty, pretty good. Pretty, pretty good. Joab, Ross, Cap, uh, Lord, Joab. That's good to know. How's David doing? <laughs> Hello? How, how's that help? Your honor, your worship? Your worship? <laughs> Joab would then say, So, uh, this message. He wants you, Ryan, to come back to the palace. <clears throat> Is that what he wants? He does absolutely want Uriah to come back to the palace. Right now. I mean, sir. And, and Joab would say, why does he want him in the palace? You better tell me right now, because if I find out you did not tell me the truth, you know what's going to happen. Do you think he wouldn't ask him? Do you think he wouldn't ferret it out of him? Do you think the messenger, beside himself, would not blunder out with something happened with Bathsheba, and we don't know what it is? And do you think that clever, conniving animal of a man would not know exactly, like a fox, what David had done? Mm. I see. Okay, go and get him off the field, take him back to the palace. Now, it says, Joab sent Uriah to David. I am a soldier in the field. I'm a triply committed Gentile soldier amongst the Jewish brethren. David's calling me to the palace? I don't understand this. And so there he is in the chariot. He's going back with this poor sweating messenger. And they're rattling along. And Uriah, maybe at some point in time, says, Why does the king want me? And the messenger says, I don't know, because that's what messengers will say. I'm just a messenger, I really don't know. And then, a little while longer, Uriah says, listen, I'm going to see the king. You've got to give me some clue about what's going on, because what am I going to say to the king? Why would the king want to talk to me? That's all my imagination. The messenger said something like, Uriah, I, I really don't know, brother. I, I don't know. But I'll tell you one thing. When you're home, try and spend some more time at home. <laughs> and if there was even a conversation that went slightly in that direction, do you not think Uriah would have the wit to at least realize something happened that shouldn't have happened? 
And so he gets there, and this is what happens. David says to Uriah, well, it says he asked of him, how Joab did, how the people did, and how the world prospered, and then David says, go down to your house and wash your feet. It's almost as if to imply, David wasn't listening to what he said at all. And Uriah is probably thinking, you brought me here so you could ask me that? How's the war going? How's Joab? What's, why would you call me for that? And now you want me to go down to my house. Okay. Okay. And then it says, Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king which then underscores the problem. Surely by this point in time, Uriah has the wit to understand something terrible that's gone wrong. I've been called, who am I, out from the field. The king is asking me questions that have to do with strategy, tactical plans, and the execution of war plans on the field. Why would he even ask me that, of all people? Then the king orders me home and sends a platter of food after me. The king doesn't do things like that. Doesn't do things like that. And so he might have worked out what had happened. Did Uriah condemn this beautiful woman that he loved to distraction? I don't think so. Think about yourself as a husband. You have a wife, barely been home for ages. She's been neglected, she's young, she's beautiful. Would you blame her for what happened? Or would you blame yourself? I just didn't spend enough time with her. I lost track of all the work. Even when I was with her, I wasn't with her. This is my fault. But I'm not going to do something that's for me. I'm going to do the right thing. So he lies down with David's servants, and then David says to him, why didn't you do what I told you to do? Uriah says to David, the ark of Israel and Judah abide in tents and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I go? Shall I go to my house? Enjoy my wife and eat and drink and be merry? As your soul lives, I won't do this thing. Where had David heard those words before? The ark and Israel, Judah abide in tents. But he had heard them out of his own mouth. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 2. It came to pass when the king sat in his house, the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in the house of Cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. David was uncomfortable with his luxury when the ark of God was in this humble little abode. And out of the mouth of this man who loved him and became a Christadelphian because of him, he has one as he himself said. And that too is the hand of the God of the fallen exercising itself in the conscience of this great man. And David hears those words and it says, David said to Uriah, look, tarry here today also, and tomorrow I'll let you depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow, and when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him, and he made him drunk. Now just imagine that. Don't imagine, you know, the sort of the medieval type nonsense you would have seen people sitting at a big throne at a meal and so on. 
They were around together, like Christ and the disciples, lying on their sides, common platter, drink to be had. It is possible the arrival was close by. It is possible that David kept handing him drink. Handing him drink so that he would cover his own personal sin. Now think of the contrast to the Lord Jesus Christ in the upper room. Handing Judas the song. Appealing to Judas to cover Judas's sin. Not his own. An incredible contrast, isn't it? The upper room and this room. But he went not down to his house. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab. Now you just consider. David is looking at a Gentile man who is like he was, and that's not the man he is today. I'm looking at the way I was. I had that kind of love for the truth, that kind of love for Yahweh, that kind of love for my people, that kind of love for my king. I was that kind of man. What happened to me? From now to protect the pedestal he's been raised onto, David has to go all the way with his deceit. He saw, he took, and now he's hiding. Just like Adam and Eve. Just like Adam and Eve. And so he writes this letter to Joab, and Joab now has David completely in his grip. Completely in his grip. Joab is going to shift the way he addresses him. The way he interacts with them. How do we know that? Just look at the attitude of Joab when we go into chapter 12 and the battle is now nigh on being won. And it says, verse 27, Joab sent messengers to David. And look at the way he writes to his king, the king of Israel. I have fought against Rabbah and I have taken the city of waters. Now therefore gather the rest of the people together and encamp against the city and take it, lest I take the city, and it be called after my name. You do not talk to a king like that. But of course, Joab now had the right in his mind to address it that way. Joab now felt that he had the freedom of discourse to send that kind of a sharp, rebuking message to David. That's the kind of relationship that these two men had. David had only made it worse for himself with Joab. Sends this message, Uriah carries his own death warrant. And sends the message saying, put him in the hottest battle in the front that he may be smitten and die. You know, Joab, you get this message. What are you going to think about your king? <laughs> Mr. Righteous, look at this. He's no better than, the, than any of us. He's no better than me. He's no better than him. So what does he do? It came to pass, when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew the valiant men were. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab. Uriah and a number of men are sent by Joab to a place they shouldn't have been, right up against the wall. Thank you.